So the angle of friction and cohesion, collectively known as shear strength parameters, are material-specific parameters. So in this video, I'm going to talk about a method for uh, deriving them experimentally uh, called the shear box test. Now, a shear box looks like this. Um, you can see that, uh, that there's two confining rings uh, and a space for your sample to sit in the middle. Um, and a lid goes onto the top where you can suspend a known normal stress onto your sample. Now the shear force is created when the two halves of the shear box uh, move away from each other. So this is what a shear box looks like in profile as a cartoon. Uh, we, you can see that we have uh, two halves of the shear box here. Uh, our sample sits in the middle of the shear box um, and on the top we have a lid. Now we put that shear box into a rig um, that fixes the bottom half of the shear box through a force transducer. So that bottom half of the shear box stays fixed, but we can measure the force going through it. Um, what we do is we suspend a normal load onto the, onto the lid of the shear box. So we put a normal load, or a normal force, onto the lid of the shear box. And we create shear, or shear force, um, using a drive motor which pushes the, uh, the, bottom half, the top half of the box away from the bottom half. So we have a drive motor. Which pushes the top half of the box away from the bottom and that creates the shear force within the, within the sample. Now if we take that normal force and we divide it by the cross-sectional area of the box, which in a uh, standard shear box test is 60 mil by 60 mil, although you can get um, different sized shear boxes. But if we take that normal force and we divide it by the uh, cross-sectional area of the shear box, what that equals is the, uh, the normal stress. Now if we take the the force that, we measure, that we're measuring in this force transducer, and we divide that by the cross-sectional area of the box. What we get is the shear stress that's going through the sample. So in the shear box test, we create shear force, uh, or we, we, we steadily ramp up the shear force that's going through our or sample until the point that the material fails. Um, and we do that with, uh, for a fixed normal force. So the key assumption that we make within the shear box test is that that normal force is actually, or the normal stress created by the normal force, is the normal effective stress. So we assume that um, the effects of pore water pressure within our sample um, or the change in pore water pressure during our test is zero. Um, and that's an important assumption and we'll come back to that in a second. But what we want to do uh, in a shear box test is represent this, um, this information on a more Coulomb failure envelope. So if we plot the um, shear stress against um, a normal effective stress, uh, what we want to do is generate the straight line um, or the more Coulomb failure line. So to do that from the shear box test, essentially we keep the normal force constant or the normal stress constant throughout the, uh, the test and we increase the shear stress until the material fails. Now if we know the normal stress and we know the, uh, the point at which uh, the shear stress at the point of failure, we can draw one point on this graph. So the normal stress and we, if we know the shear stress of failure, we get a point. And let's say it's there. What we want to do in a shear box test is replicate that um, a number of times um, at different normal forces. So at different points along this, this x-axis, we want to uh, recreate this test and uh, record the shear stress at failure. So we'll stick a different normal load onto the top of the shear box um, with a new sample, stick a new normal stress on, um, and then uh, uh, and then shear the sample until it fails. So if we increase the normal stress and we, um, we record the shear stress at failure, we'll get another point here. Um, 
And we do this uh, uh, three or four times until we can get our straight line. And if we draw a line through the data, we have our more cool on failure envelope. We can take the gradient of that line, uh, which is uh, tan uh, phi. So if we take the um, uh, the the inverse tan of the gradient, we get uh, our phi, and we also take the the intercept here which is the cohesion. Uh, and that has units uh, of whatever uh, stress units you had your shear stress in, so kilonewtons per meter squared in most cases. So we found phi and we found the cohesion, so that's our shear strength parameters. So how do we know which shear stress to record, or how do we know when the samples failed? Well, to do that, we need to, um, to measure um, two other properties, um, and that's the uh, shear strain and the volumetric strain of the sample. But to measure that in the shear box test, what we do is we have transducer, a displacement transducer, not a force transducer this time, but a displacement transducer that measures the displacement of the lid. So we measure how, um, whether the lid um, uh, moves up or down during the, the, the test. So we can measure the change in height of the sample, delta H. And if we take that delta H and we divide it by the initial sample height, uh, so H0, the initial sample height, delta H over H0, um, that's equal to our volumetric strain. So how do we measure shear strain within our sample? Well, the shear strain is defined like this. So if we had a, a block of material, and we subjected that block of material to a shear stress, tau, that block of material will tend to deform in this way. So you would get um, the material deforming like this. So shear strain is defined by this angle, the, the angle at which the um, material uh, displaces through. Um, and essentially that's equivalent to the um, the horizontal displacement, or x, divided by the initial height, shear zero. So shear strain, um, when we come to the shear box uh, test, is defined by the this displacement x, and we measure that through another, using another transducer. So the displacement x divided by the initial height. So shear strain. Uh, gamma is equal to delta x over h naught. So if we record these through the uh, through the course of the shear box test, we can um, we can assess how the material is straining and uh, record the the shear stress at the point of failure. So if we plot a shear uh, a stress versus strain diagram of the shear box test, it looks something like this. So if we plot a stress-strain curve for, um, for a, a during a shear box test with a strain on the x-axis and stress on the y-axis, it will look something like this, where we get an increase uh, in strain and stress, or stress with, with strain, till we reach the peak. It would um, come down and then fail. So this is a um, classic stress-strain uh, diagram for an initially dense soil. Uh, loose soils behave slightly differently, and we don't get this, this apparent peak where the material just strains like that. We'll come back to why uh, these behave differently in a second. 
but there's some artifacts of this curve that we need to point out now. Um, well, the question is, at which point do we take the material to have failed? Is it failure after the peak? Is it failure in the residual? Or is it failure, um, is it failure in the critical or the residual? So, so let's just level those up. We have a peak. We have a critical. And we have a residual strength. Um, so which uh, shear stre stress do we take um, for a more Coulomb failure envelope? Uh, well, the answer is a little bit complicated. Um, in a shear box test, we'll record all three if it's available. And depending on which situation or which um, design situation that we're, we're looking at, um, we might use a peak, a critical, or a residual. Um, so for, for now, we'll just record all three in the shear box test. And we'll deal with um, which situations to, to use those different values when we talk about design. So if we come back to the more Coulomb failure envelope uh, with the normal effective stress on the x-axis and the shear stress on the y-axis, and we draw all three of those lines, the peak, the critical, and the residual, it should look something like this. We'll not always have a peak. Uh, that only exists for initially dense soils. Uh, but if it's there, we should record it. Um, and from these three lines, each line, um, we can generate a shear strength parameters. And we'll come back to you later when we're, start, when we're talking about geotechnical design, uh, when we distinguish between these three lines. But for now, let's just record all three.